Hey everybody, this is Corey Hill. I want to welcome you to our July SC Chats. We're so excited that you're here. Today we're going to be talking about what parents wish service coordinators knew about rights, waivers, and transitions. So I'm glad that you all are able to join us. Um, as I said, I'm Corey Hill. I work at the Partnership for People with Disabilities at Virginia Commonwealth University and I oversee the early intervention professional development. And I would like to introduce Erin Croyle and let her tell you a little bit about herself. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Erin Croyle. I work for the Partnership for People with Disabilities as well. I work for an organization called the Center for Family Involvement. Um, we are based in Virginia. I actually live in Ithaca now, uh, New York. Um, I moved up here a couple of years ago. Um, I, uh, I am, I work for the CFI, but I'm also a parent of three children. My oldest has Down syndrome and the other two are neurotypical. So uh, Arlo is 10 and you might see one of them eventually, but that's important because I am also a parent and I was part of EI and I sing its praises regularly. Um, I have a journalism background, so I kind of took what I had with that and rolled it into this job. Thanks, Erin. So before we dive in, I wanna be sure that you have access to the handout that we created. Um, you should have gotten that with the login information and Dana will also drop that in chat um, so that you have our resources too as we are talking. So Erin is going to tell you all a little bit about the Center for Family Involvement, and then we'll talk a little bit about why we decided to do this webinar together. So go ahead, so, Erin. Thanks, Corey. So as I said a minute ago, um, I work for the Center for Family Involvement. We're at VCU's Partnership for People with Disabilities. Um, we, uh, and I keep messing up with my notes, but so the Center for Family Involvement is, um, an organization made up of people who uh, work with families to increase their skills as advocates, mentors, and leaders so that families, children, and young adults with disabilities can live the lives that they want. Um, the CFI is a team of people with disabilities, parents, siblings, um, and other professionals. All of us have advocated, mentored, and taking on leadership roles that support people with disabilities so they can lead the lives that they want. So everyone who is part of the partnership um, has a child or a loved one who has a disability. We also know how important it is that you get good unbiased information. And it's the first step in the role that we have. Um, we know how much training can help everyone become their best advocates and mentors and leaders. So that's a huge focus of our work. We focus heavily on the emotional informational support. So our goal is to empower families so that they have the skills and confidence to handle tough situations that come up. Our hope is that some of them will also go on to become advocates. We partner with our sister net, uh, network, which is the Center for Disability Leadership, which focuses on self-advocacy. Um, the CFI, we utilize family navigators. Uh, these are volunteers. So they go through rigorous training, which also includes cultural competence. We look into Medicaid waiver training, IEP training, transitioning training, which transitioning, you know, for you all that we often focus on transitioning from EI into schools, but there's also transitioning later on from high school to college to the workforce or even to retirement. Um, we have an elder care specialist, which we're really proud of. She helps families understand the options and supports that we need to think about um, super early in life for later in life. Um, our regional network coordinators are all across Virginia and they keep a pulse on what's going on. We also have a deaf and hard of hearing specialist. We have a visually impaired and blind specialist, a rural specialist, that elderhood specialist I mentioned, a mental health specialist. We also have cultural brokers in various communities across the Commonwealth, including Latinx, Asian, African-American, um, and refugees families. So these resources are really important because as you probably see a lot of the work you 
we do with families affected by disability, those, those other things that are going on in our life really um, affect everything. Um, but what makes our organization really, really unique is that beyond the state of Virginia, or the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have a network um, on a national scale. So if we can't find a family in Virginia who we can match based on disability, based on race, culture, religion, um, you know, other things that affect our, our being on this world, we can tap into our national network. We find parents and caregivers that are dealing with rare diagnoses. We help them if they have comorbidities that they can't find anyone who can relate to. We even have linked families internationally to make sure that they have the right fit. Because some people, even one of our staff members, her daughter, her daughter's disability is so rare that there's like 15 in the world. And we know that connecting people is critical. Um, we know how much our personal beliefs play a role in that. And so we make sure that our staff and volunteers are as diverse as possible. You know, and when Aaron and I first started um, thinking about this collaboration, one of the things that we recognized is that we work at the same organization, the same agency, but how much did we really know what our projects were doing? Erin and I have known us, as she said, our, um, Arlo is, am I right, 10, did you say Erin, 10 now? Yeah. Correct. Um, and Erin and I met each other when Arlo was under one, maybe about eight or nine months, I'm guessing. And you all might recognize some of the, um, and some of the pictures from our videos um, Aaron's husband, Daniel, helped us with all the videography and Aaron played a key role in that. She also is the voiceover in many, in some of our modules. So you will recognize her voice. So we've had a longstanding relationship, but when we started talking about, do we really know what EI and CFI are doing? Are we linking people? Are we coordinating? And the answer was probably not as well as we should. So we really started thinking about how we could collaborate for our two projects to um, share more information and in particular help service coordinators know about this valuable resource through CFI. Erin, did you wanna add anything else to that? No, I think that's good. And someone, I, I just saw a question I was going to answer, but I'll answer it verbally. You know, asking more about our cultural brokers, they all keep a pulse on what's going on in their communities. A good example of that is um, we are going to be hosting a vaccine hesitancy live event on Facebook soon that talks about the issues and why certain people are reluctant to get vaccine. It goes beyond just the political climate today, you know, the history of African Americans being tested on medically and people with disabilities. The, you know, the issues that a lot of people are going through go so far beyond our own personal experience. Those cultural brokers can really tap in and relate to things that not everybody can. The other thing we probably should say is we really do hope to keep this as a conversation. So feel free, um, I, I think it was Maya, but I'm not sure, like um, the last person just did, if you have questions, feel free to um, type those in chat and we will try to hit them as we go along. Again, when we started thinking about this um, SC chat, we started thinking, we only have an hour, how can we hone in on what we wanna talk about, um, knowing that potentially there could be future things that can, can come from this collaboration. But we started talking about what we've been calling our three chunks. And those are paperwork, procedural safeguards and rights, waivers and transition. And again, these are each such big topics. They could warrant their own um, webinar or their own work of some sort of professional development product but it's a way for us to at least getting the, get the conversation going um, today. So we're going to start first with paperwork, procedural safeguards, and rights. One of the things that we know is that you all know, without us telling you, 
in early intervention, there is a lot of documentation, a lot of paperwork. And what, when I um, am one of the trainers for kaleidoscope service coordination training, that's one of the things that we hear all the time. How do you manage? How do you keep up? Particularly if you're a new service coordinator, what are tools and strategies? And for those who are in kaleidoscope, just trying to find their own process that works to keep up with all of that. But we also know the flip side of this is, is, is that all of that documentation and all of that paperwork is so essential and so important because it protects parents' rights. Um, and we need to be sure that even though it can sometimes feel like it bogs us down, that we really are well prepared in order to help protect those family rights. So when Erin and I started talking about this, she had all of these personal experiences that she could share. And then when we're done, we're gonna talk a little bit about some strategies we came up with. So um, thanks, Corey. Yeah, it's, it's weird. You know, I feel like so often we talk about paperwork and it just it, it, it just feels like so boring. Right. But I can say as a parent and I'm an informed parent. Right. I'm on top of things. I, you know, took everything super seriously, did all the research, you know, I'm the super dorky, nerdy parent that learned all the things and was diving in head first. And even at the end of my stay with early intervention, um, I honestly did not actually know what IFSP stood for. Like that's how overwhelmed I was. Even though my son had the most amazing service coordinators, a lot of that stuff just, I was hurting, right? And so many of the parents that you're seeing, they're in these early stages of um, trauma and grief. Um, oh my, sorry. And I just see the name of uh, Juliet is just joining and I know Juliet well, and she's one of the amazing people that Arlo worked with. Um, so a lot of these parents are in these early stages of trauma and grief. And when you have a child with a disability, it's not really something that you wish for. So in addition to all this trauma that parents are going through, they're coming to terms with their own bias against disability. Um, you know, a lot of them are realizing that their life is never going to be the same. You're at, you all are seeing these families at such a fragile time. And, you know, there's so much paperwork that comes across to us it's just, we're just inundated and we miss it all. Literally at the end of uh, my son's time in EI, I had a stack of paperwork and I, I, I had always intended on reading it and I just didn't um, because I was so shell-shocked, right? Um, so families really just need these things to be explained to them in a really tangible way. Um, meaningful way like we we need like we need it spelled out to us and something to our, uh Corey and I talked about um this is something I learned back when I was in school and I find it so applicable in so many parts of my life um so I was learning to become a DJ in college and one of the managers at the radio station pointed out it's like listen the time where you're getting sick of a song and you don't want to hear it anymore because you're there every day. Starting to get into that song and it's just catching on for them. And I feel that way about paperwork. I feel that way about the things that we do in our jobs. Just when things are clicking for us, we're all sick of it. We think everyone knows it, but the people that we are dealing with, the people that you're dealing with in their work, all of this is new every single term you're throwing at them, unless they have a child that's already been through it, is brand new. And even if they've had a child that's already been through it, they might know not know all of it. So that like really spelling things out as if they're a six-year-old right along with the, their children is really important. Yeah, I think, Erin, um, one of the things I remember when I first met you when we were doing that, um, and I didn't even tell you when we were kind of talking and preparing about this, but I remember going into Aaron's house and we were going to be doing some videotaping um, 
Arlo was having a feeding, um, some feeding therapy. So it was early in the morning and Erin had little sticky notes all around her kitchen table of what the outcomes and, and what the tips and strategies she had gotten from um, Molly, Molly Wallace, I think was your um, speech language pathologist at that time. And I remember thinking she's coming up with those strategies. So one of the things um, that we want to talk about today is we want to get your ideas to share um, with each other because sometimes we find that service coordinators learn from each other and they take it and say, now this works for me. This is the one I have been looking for um, that I couldn't figure out. So what I want you all to think about and feel free to put in chat um, before we give you some strategies, what are some ideas you use to help families understand their rights and procedural safeguards? So go ahead and put those in chat. I'll give you just a few minutes. Um, and I'll catch up a little bit on the email too. Elizabeth is mentioning the paperwork is overwhelming. Um, any thought to get an organizational consultant or something from the highest level to try to streamline. Love that idea. Um, and Dana mentioned there is some work, uh, work group at the Park C office to look at streamlining. This is not new that people all say how um, overwhelming it can be. But what strategies do you guys use to help families? Angelina says, I pause and ask if they have any questions and invite them to slow me down because at, um, I understand that it can be overwhelming. Yeah, sometimes we have our script in our head and it just comes out so fast. And then you look over and think, I don't know if they understood. Elizabeth says, during the assessment for walk through the IFSP with the family so they can understand the document that we're giving them. Yeah, even our IFSP is many, many pages. It's a, it's a lot to have to process. And then you think about families who English might not be their first language, who might have um, a lower level literacy rate. All of those things can be pretty daunting. What else do you guys do? And Elizabeth said, and explain what IFSP stands for. Exactly. Exactly. I think Dana Childress tells a story about like there's this whole nother world and this whole nother alphabet in early intervention that people, people don't know. Um, Penny says provide a cheat sheet with all of the acronyms. We actually have one of those posted. I'm terrible at finding things really quickly while I'm talking. But Dana Childress is behind the scenes. Dana, if there if there's any way you can pull that, she says she won it. Um, she'll get it before I can finish talking. That's not a skill set of mine, but we'll drop that in. But there is one. It all, um, it actually was also translated by um, one of your colleagues who translated it into Spanish too. So that's available. I'm going to give you guys one more second to see if you have some other ideas. Um, I hope I say, I'm saying your name right. Addie says, use family-friendly language while explaining their rights and services. Yeah, that's an important one. It is important. We talk about trying not to use jargon, um, but it is important for families to know the words because they're going to be hear, hearing those words and acronym, acronyms. So Addie's idea of using that family uh, friendly language to explain those rights, but also make sure that they know what all of those acronyms and the terms that are being used. You also see in chat, thank you, Dana. Dana um, put the lingo um, in both English and Spanish, if that's a tool that you all could use. Let's see, Jay Kerr says she sent, uh, or they send an encrypted email um, with the first three pages of the IFSP filled out before the ASP, so parents can see what an IFSP looks like before a meeting, and then make any edits they want to. Thank you, thank you for that strategy. 
All right, so let's go ahead and see some of the ones that Aaron and I came up for some strategies. First of all, um, we talk a lot, the practice manual, I know that at times it, it's such a big document, it can be pretty daunting again, but I really encourage that people take the time to read it and routinely refer to it. Um, be sure and use that as your, your reference document. There are so many rich tools in there. Um, there are checklists, there are ways to kind of form the conversation. So we strongly encourage. Um, I also, um, I do a lot of uh, pre-service, so student prep preparation and have them think about using the practice manual. What, what works for them? Um, I have students who use those little sticky flags or um, sticky notes. They highlight things like make that your own. Now, probably many of you aren't using back in the day, we all had a huge big practice manual printed out, but there are still ways you can do online to, to make the practice manual for things that you can um, find really readily. Um, somebody's asking for, uh, before I can even get to it, the link to the practice manual um, is now posted in chat, if that's something that you all um, want access. The other thing um, that I really encourage is practice and practice and practice some more how to explain those rights and procedural safeguards. Again, when thinking about training new service coordinators or students who will have to do this in their student teaching and early intervention, um, what I find is they practice with um, a roommate or you know a partner and just get comfortable and then you can have you can have that person say did you really understand what I just explained to you if this was really relevant to you so um, just a really easy tip to to think about is just practicing um, Dana says you can also find the rights and procedural safeguard documents in the resource library as well Erin, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, next two bullets? Absolutely. Um, I think, and I'm sure you all do this, but I think really letting families know why this paperwork is so important. Um, you know, having this knowledge really empowers parents. Understanding it is kind of their first step in a, in a, in a lifetime of advocacy that they're going to have to do. Um, it's really important to just go over which sheets are really critical. And it's, I would definitely also pay attention to like nonverbal cues. You know, I can look very engaged, but my brain is running a mile a minute. And I think, you know, I, I, I assume many of you are women on this call as women. We have so much going on in our life that we're hearing you but our brain is juggling a hundred other things and we're going a mile a minute. And so just really highlighting the whys, even stressing what can maybe wait until later to read over, stressing what's really important to read word for word as, a port, as opposed to like something that just to keep in a file. Um, I think, sorry about that. I think uh, on the next point, you know, helping families organize and prioritize. Um, you know, you're going to identify the most important documents that are in that stack, right? And you're going to let them know which ones they should keep. Um, I, I think about, you know, when we do IEPs, you're told to keep every little bit of paperwork for every single year as you move forward. You know, with the IFSP and the information you all are giving, it might not be as important, but I just remember like, the families that you're giving this paperwork through to, I mean, I literally have an entire file cabinet full of my son's paperwork dealing with his disability from, you know, school stuff to IEP stuff, to doctor stuff, to um, Medicaid stuff, to all the things, okay? So helping them kind of sift through 
the chaos that they, it's coming their way right now is really, really helpful. Yeah, and when Erin and I were talking about this one too, and, and she was talking to me, what she just said about really identifying, we have to explain all of that. We, that's part of what we do, but really helping to hone in what are the ones like two separate piles. These are the ones that are gonna be high priority was such an interesting idea. And what I thought about for that one is how many of you have gone to the doctor and they ask you if you want your HIPAA document, you know, you're signing things and, you know, you're like, no, no, I don't need that. No, I don't need that. But particularly in the early stages, when all of this is so new, there are things that I want to be sure that, um, that I read and understand. Um, and then when I go back for follow-up appointments with my doctor, I don't need to read the HIPAA stuff again. But again, does anybody, I have heard from some service coordinators of local systems who have ways that they do help families organize. They have like a family folder or a notebook. Um, so I want to see if you can put in chat again, do you have any strategies like that, that maybe your system uses that might be helpful to other service coordinators? Go ahead and type those in chat. And while they're typing, I'm actually curious, you know, I know a friend of mine, her, her, her daughter's older and she started um, photocop, not photo, scanning because there's so much paperwork. So she's created scans. So I'm curious if there's a movement towards allowing there to be electronic versions of things mm -hmm. so parents can just keep a file on their computer. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let them answer that too. Yeah. So two questions, if you have things in your system um, and do you scan things that parents can put an electronic version? It's always funny during the webinar, it used to be that I could tell when people were typing. Now I'm not able to with the old platform. So I'm not sure if people were trying to. So I'm going to give you about 20 more seconds to see if you can help with answering Aaron's question. Do you scan so families can keep a version, an electronic version? Dana says having an electronic version seems especially relevant with telehealth. Uh-huh. Maya says, uh, oops, I lost it. Sorry, Maya. Um, she says, um, from the State Park C office um, in Washington, most of our providers do send e-copies of documents, especially since COVID. Welcome. Thank you for joining us, Maya. Lori from Chesapeake says, has been sending forms and rights to parents via DocuSign. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's a virtual um, way to get signatures and parents can choose to print it or keep it electronically. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Jamie says, since COVID, we have almost all documents available to families. They also use DocuSign. Yeah, VCU has gone to DocuSign, handy little tool. Um, Paige says, I enjoy having electronic versions of documents. We're now offering families options to getting the documents emailed and parents appreciate that. Katie says they scan, give a family a copy. Hi, Tony. Uh, she says should they provide folders to keep all documents together as well as it, uh, having important contact information accessible. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Sarah. In Arlington, we primarily use Electra. They use DocuSign um, as well. Uh, Marty says Western Tidewater is using right signature and information for the intake is sent out ahead, ahead of time. Um, Terry Lee says uh, her understanding is that uh, Loudoun County moves towards um, a lot of systems have electronic records in place, but others are still moving. Um, so perhaps it will include a parent uh, portal 
you know, it's interesting about parent portals, patient portals, you know, that's being used in school systems. I was talking to a colleague who actually had to go to the ER recently, and she said, I accessed my patient portal, and she was getting her test results before the doctor came in and shared because she had, and I was like, I would have never thought of that. But yeah, people are using those portals. Um, Angelina says, as Norfolk has been sending intake forms to parents, um, confirmation email to for the assessment appointment. Um, they also mail a copy so they can have a paper copy. Paige says same thing with Roanoke. Thank you guys. I appreciate you sharing that some of that. Well, so it's on mixed And I bag. feel like, sorry, Corey, I feel like I should add too when we talk about how overwhelming paperwork is. I think even online paperwork can be overwhelming too. And we should keep that in mind. You know, mm -hmm. if you have more than one child or more than one doctor, for instance, my son has multiple patient portals and it's a lot of logging in and it's a lot of juggling and a lot of remembering passwords. So, and I don't mean to sound like a Debbie Downer. It's just, I want you to know the reality that families face. So we might have something really new and amazing but remember that all of that new and amazing is coming at them depending on how significant the disability might be from like multiple different places. Well, and I think the other thing with what we're talking to about all these electronic versions is that there are, there are different levels of technology savvy too. And do I know how to get on a, a portal? Do I know how to access? Okay, so what does it mean when I get in there? Um, again, another interesting experience just recently that I had is I went to a restaurant because of COVID, they did not have a paper menu. Um, and so there were on the um, napkin dispenser, um, there was a QR code that you clicked on. Well, I knew what to do, but I watched a couple who would have been about my parents' age and the waiter kind of bebopped over and said, just click on that with your phone and then you can tell me what you want. And I watched the look on that couple's face like, really, we just came for pizza and is there a pepperoni pizza that, you know, like, I don't know how to do this with my phone. And we have families who are in all levels of that technology savviness too that we have to think about. Yeah. So, all right, thank you guys for sharing your ideas. Let's keep going. All right, so when we started thinking about the next chunk and we talked about waivers, again, we thought we could do so much about waivers. Erin is exceptionally knowledge about that, but we're gonna give just a little go to kind of give you a, a, a flavor of this. What I'd like you guys to do is look at this kind of scale of how comfortable you are with your knowledge of waivers. Um, so what you can do is you can use your stamp tool. If you go to the top of your screen, you should see something that says you're seeing Corey Hill's screen. And if you scroll up there, you should see annotate and get a drop down with a stamp tool. You can pick whatever stamp tool you want and put your stamp on where you fall on this continuum. If you don't know how to use the annotate tool, don't worry, just go ahead and type it in chat. We'll try to keep up um, too with what folks are saying in chat. I see people putting the thank you. Take about 20 more seconds. And again, if you don't know how to use your stamp tool, it's fine to just type it in chat. So the interesting thing is, as you guys can see on screen, nobody thinks they're a pro um, on, on waivers. And it's because it, they change a lot. There's a lot of knowledge. Um, so we appreciate your thinking about where you are. It looks like we have sort of this um, 
pretty even from sort of comfortable, fairly comfortable to comfortable. Um, and then even a couple of people who aren't comfortable at all, which is kind of what we expected. So let's see if I can clear this. Just a reminder, um, if you be sure you also um, use the little red X in your annotate so that you're not, you don't continue to just accidentally stamp um, on the screen. All right, let's see. So let's think a little bit um, about waivers. And one of the things that, again, when we were talking about this, one of the things that I remembered, and then I checked in with um, Catherine Hancock, is that a couple of years ago, there had been a pretty strong disparity across Virginia that some local systems were having a lot of success helping families access waiver services. And Others weren't having any success at all. It became a big discussion at the um, Virginia Interagency Coordinating Council, the VIC meetings for, um, for quite a while. And I just did want to let you all know that as a result of that, the Department of Medicaid uh, Medical Assistance, uh, DMAS, did some training to really make sure that they are, the people who did their interviews, who gathered information from families, had the same training across the state in um, really striving to make sure that there was more equity across states, that it wasn't just if you got, if you lived in Northern Virginia and you got um, somebody who was less familiar versus if you lived in Chesapeake and a pretty skilled interviewer who was successful helping families. So um, that was an initiative that was taken on through the VIC. Um, so, Aaron, I want you to talk about a little bit about the parent perspective of waivers. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, y'all, waivers are so hard. Um, and the process of waivers for a family is brutal. And I'm sure most of you know, you know, there's a embarrassingly large waiting list in Virginia for families. Um, and that's honestly, it's not okay. It's no one's fault here on this call, but it's not okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give an example. Like I moved to New York state. I chose, I, I wouldn't have moved to New York state had I not known that their waiver system was different. I had to do so much to get my son on a waiver in Virginia. It was really trying New York it was instantaneous. I mean, the process took months to get everything in place, but there were no questions that my son who has Down syndrome, who has complex medical needs, who has all these things that he needed and deserved a waiver. No questions here whatsoever. You still have to prove it, okay? You still have to show the disability. There's still paperwork, but um, so Virginia is one of those states where unfortunately the waiver process is just not easy for families, okay? It's never easy, but Virginia, it's not a given that a family can get it. And that's very much unfair. Um, so, you know, speaking as a parent and a parent who works with a lot of other parents, the waiver process is brutal, but it's really, really um, imperative. And it's imperative that families know the information as soon as possible, because the waiting list is long. Um, and very, very long, okay? So you're gonna, in, you're gonna see parents of children who have lifelong disabilities. You're gonna see parents who children might just have a short disability, but might have some complex medical needs and Medicaid might help them now to, to deal with a lot of those things. So, you know, back when I was well-versed with Virginia's waivers, it was EDCD, right? And now it's CCC plus. And then there's the developmental disability waivers. So, you know, the structures have changed, but you know, I don't, I, I know that the training throughout the state is very, very different. Um, in my time throughout helping my son and other teacher and other parents, we were given misinformation such as you can't apply for a waiver until you're two years old, or you can't apply for a waiver until you're five years old. Or, um, oh no, you make too much for your child to get a waiver. 
or um, your, your child's needs aren't enough for there to be a waiver. All of these things were false. They are false. There are still families trying to get on the waiting list who have given up. Um, it, it's just, it's important to know that the waiver system is very complicated. Um, a lot of what families hear is through the grapevine. A lot of professionals think that they know something but are actually giving the wrong information. Um, and, you know, if you apply for a waiver once and you're denied, you're like, you have to start all over again. And the process of going to get your child a waiver, you know, we're talking about paperwork. This is having someone come to your home, assess all the deficits in your child, focusing on the worst days and the terrible things that you have to go through. It is gut wrenching. So to go through that more than once because someone gives you the wrong information or to go through that and, and not get the waiver, but then still really need help, which happens all the time, it is absolutely awful. I cannot begin to explain how, and I, I could cry if I let myself, so I'm going to stop myself, but how demeaning and degrading and frustrating and awful trying to get my child a waiver is. I cannot even begin, the amount of families I know who have tried to get their children waivers and have gone through that over and over and over again is awful. Um, so it's important. And I, I have to say that a lot of, I, I, I know that not everyone here on this chat, every agency, every city is different in how they handle waivers. I think me being here, I wanna just, say like the Center for Family Involvement can help with waivers. That's where a really good time to refer out is so important because it is probably one of the worst things families have to go through aside from getting their child's diagnosis oh. is like, is begging for help. And, and, and getting a waiver is literally begging people to help you. It is awful. Um, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. I know there are a lot of tips, so I'll stop. No, I think you know, when Erin, when we were talking that she feels so passionately um, and making sure that service coordinators, first of all, know about waivers, I want to be sure and highlight that on the handout that we prepared for you, um, there is a brand new document as of July 6th from DMAS um, that I linked. It's been updated. So if you're looking for hot off the presses, more waiver information. Be sure and look at your. Um, be sure and look at that handout. Let's see. Um, Dana just also dropped the handout again. Thanks, Dana. So we came up with um, we came up with some tips that Erin um, is going to try to highlight for you all. Absolutely. So I think um, it's really important to just be familiar with the waiver options. You know, I know it's not your job to necessarily know everything, not all of your jobs, right? But just know, just have an idea. Um, the Arc of Virginia has a really great website that explains all the waivers. We have that on our own website that links it. It's just important to understand it. Um, and it's important to point it out early, okay? Any family who has, a, you know, I know that some families you see it's simply just needing OT or speech. It's not complicated, but any family that has something more, something that is likely lifelong, it's really important to start early. Those wait lists are really, really long. Some families, if you have a child with a wheelchair, they might need a ramp built, you know, get on that waiting list so they can access money. The other thing to remember, the wait lists are long, but you can actually um, access funds, which is also unfortunately called IFSP funds. Um, it's a different acronym. But you can access funds once you're on the wait list that can help support your child in many, many different ways. And every year those funds are available. Um, it's really important to know that with waivers, families must focus on deficits. So not only is that gut wrenching, but you know, parents wanna focus on the positive and we deserve to, but I, everyone needs to remind folks that, you know, remind parents and families that when it comes to the waiver process, 
you, you unfortunately need to remember, like if your child isn't on their way to toileting at age two or three, and it's a substantial delay, you have to point that out. So often in the lives of people who have children with disabilities, you don't even recognize the deficits because it's your life, but they're there. So you need reminders to, to point out the worst and it stinks. Um, and then finally, stress the importance of these waivers, okay? Some families might say that, oh, I don't need it. It's no big deal. We're okay, we're okay. Well, you know what? Our elder care specialist deals with families who said they didn't need it and their parents are to the point where they might be dying for soon or might not physically be able to care for their child. And that waiver list is 10 years long and their child who's an adult needs help now. This sounds crazy, but we do not know what's gonna happen to ourselves as parents in 10 years. We could have an accident and we might not be physically or financially capable to care for our child with a disability. So considering the waivers now, even though you think you got it handled, is really important to have that safety blanket for your child for a lifetime. Thanks, Aaron. You guys will also see in chat that, um, I can't remember if I put that on the resource list. This might've been one that um, Aaron provided, but the ARC of Virginia has an intro to Medicaid waivers and that link is now in your chat. Um, all right, I'm looking at our time. So we're gonna go ahead and hit our next chunk, which is transition. Again, we, um, we really did think so much that could be talked about, but one of the really nice things is that there are a lot of resources, professional development resources already related to transition. I tagged a bunch of those on your handout. Um, particularly the transition page on VEIPD, um, but that will help you explore a lot of, uh, lot of different things. But Erin's gonna talk to you about what it looked like from a parent perspective. And I love this slide. So I, um, this, and, me, and I'll, um, sorry. Go ahead, Erin, yeah. uh, I just see really quickly, um, Lori says, Getting a waiver also means that a child can get long-term care, uh, yes. long-term care Medicaid, which is also helpful for families. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, and Dana and, dropped the transition page too. Go and ahead. Lori, to that about the waiver, you know what saved us when my son finally got a waiver in Virginia? Co-pays. Like literally between therapies, once you're out of EI, you have to pay for therapy out of your pocket, right? So I was paying... God, like three, $400 a month just in co-pays for all my son's therapies. And once we had a waiver and we have Medicaid, you know, it could cover those co-pays. All the specialists you see, you know, $30 a pop, the co-pays. So there's more to it. There's so much more to it. And it's so important. And in, so I'm going to go through this last part quickly because, you know, time. But um, as a parent, I've written about this. I think it's important to point out like, Early intervention felt like this warm blanket, okay? Like you all are amazing in what you do. Parents are, are truly suffering, okay? And it felt like this warm blanket of like love and information and kindness. And you all are very good at transition as well. Um, I find in my personal experience and from what I've heard from families, you know, you, you go to those meetings, you all offer to send someone with a parent, you know, we all know how hard that first IEP meeting is, right? But suddenly EI is gone and parents, I mean, I have literally, I remember sitting in a meeting for my son where they said he didn't belong in kindergarten here. And I remember meetings about preschool where, you know, oh no, he's, you know, he's, his disability is too much for a private preschool, you know, send him somewhere else. I see what other parents go through where the things that, others can say and the way that our community treats people with disabilities, you feel vulnerable, you feel left out in the cold and it is awful. And so, you know, without early intervention, without that support from these amazing professionals who really care about our kids, parents are left kind of like cold and alone. Um, I think we can go to the next. Okay. Yeah. So before we, 
give you some tips and stuff. We have a quick poll question we want you all to do. We, um, Aaron in particular, was really interested. How many of you have attended a transition meeting? So we're going to put a poll up in just a second, and you can respond to that. Hang on just one minute. There you go. Looks like the question kind of chopped off. The question is, have you attended a transition meeting with at least one family? We'll take, I can see that you all are still voting. We'll take about 20 seconds to allow you to continue to vote. All right, Dana, can you publish the poll for us, please? So it looks like out of um, our participants, 87% of you have attended at least one transition and four of you, 13% haven't. Um, that might be that you're new, that's not been an opportunity. Um, but we wanted, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about what you all thought the benefits might be of attending a transition meeting, a child study, um, the IEP meeting. So type in chat what you think the benefits might be of attending the transition meeting and what strategy or if there are any strategies you want to share. Sarah says definitely it's a support to the family. Helping the family feel. Yep, Jamie's agreeing with you, Sarah. Thank you. Lori says, being readily at hand to hear what Part B staff is saying, support and encouragement from Marty. Helpful to hear the same thing the family here. Such a good thing, Rami. So they need, you need to be able to say, did you hear this like I did? Um, Penny says, understanding, oh, you guys are coming in really fast. I lost that, Penny. Hang on, I'll find it. Penny says, understanding or at least being exposed to what the next services might, might, be, might be available. Um, Melissa asking about the next steps. Loretta, introducing the child and family to the school. Yeah, that it's such an emotional time and having that support that you all talk about talk about is is really important. So we do encourage if there are opportunities for service coordinators to join those. So let's look at some of our strategies that we came up with. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about in early intervention is transition is really thinking about what the next steps are and breaking that down to be individualized for what the family needs maybe going and visiting the school, attending meetings with them, um, sharing information. Um, so really helping families think about that. But even more important, thinking about what a big step transition can be. And Aaron designed that slide um, with the exposed kind of naked person. And I thought it was so powerful. Um, it is really hard to think of your little one going to big school, particularly if they are two or three going to big school, changing the service system and the delivery is different. So, um, whoops, sorry about that. You guys, I'm getting a pop-up. So those are um, important things to, to think about. Um, what do you think, Erin? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that that it's a huge step. I think all of you nailed it really, like just being there because here's the parents had all the support and all of a sudden they're alone in a room with six to 12 other people. Um, so I think this is all important. Um, one thing I really, I, I think that really is important that we pass on is that transitioning is empowering parents to know that they're their child's number one advocate. And you, do, you all do this a lot, but you know, in school, like, like that previous slide, you know, we're leaving this area 
where we've had all this help and this love and this affection to a place where honestly schools are looking to save money. Parents aren't gonna get the services they expect and want. And, and they need to learn to be strong and be tough and say what they need to say. Not always, it doesn't have to be contentious, but it's very, very real and it's new and it's, it's the comfort and the, the nurturing is not there. The other thing to remember is, you know, your child is the focal point. That child is the focal point of a meeting. Um, they will one day leave that meeting they are the most important person on that IEP team. They forever and always will be. So, you know, you can either bring a picture. I've always had my son come to the meetings, even if he can't participate, you know, in what someone say is a meaningful way, humanizing who this person is and having them there is so critical, even if it's a picture, even if it's the way to express it. And I think that's part of why having a service coordinator or someone from the IFSP team is really important. Um, you know, I know for myself personally, um, I don't know if anyone knows Deatrice Williams, but like, she's amazing and I love her. And she came to my son's transition meeting. You know, she was there to support me. She was there for me to like say, does that seem right to you? You know, she was there because she'd been there. It was my first time. Um, and that it really helps to have someone who knows what they're doing, but who is on your team who understands it. Um, and I should add, I mean, that's part of why I wanted to come here, right? I, I'm really not great at promoting, but you know, the Center for Family Involvement, we are a sister network, frankly, of Corey's team, right? So those questions that you can't answer, or if you, if you know a family who needs some support, you know, that's what the CFI is for. There, there's this, what I did notice in my experience as a parent is that the professionals in my life are able to clock out at the end of the day. And for me and the families that I'm with, we never clock out. This consumes us all the time. And it helps for us to talk to someone who it also consumes, right? We're never able to compartmentalize it. It's always a part of our life. So the Center for Family Involvement's here to have people so they can commiserate, so they can throw ideas off of. That is our place to, to really help families with that emotional stuff because we understand it. We're in it every day. It never leaves us. It is always in here and in here. So. So hopefully the big takeaway from, um, from today is to know about uh, Center for Family Involvement. But take a second and type in chat if there are two takeaways or at least one that you got from our session today, we'd love to see what you got. Angelina got the lingo chart. Um, so I'm glad that was a resource. I hope that um, Sarah says a greater understanding of how difficult it is for families in Virginia to get waivers. Um, starting the waiver process early, Terry says. Um, thanks, Maya. I love the Virginia system and all the resources. A reminder of the heartaches. Thanks, Susan. Family's perspective. Yeah, lots of resources. Again, we hope um, you guys feel free. We will be able to collect the chat, but we hope that this has been really helpful and that you have gotten some um, resources. Dana is going to chop, uh, to chop our social media platforms um, that we hope that you will um, decide to follow us and get more um, updates on things we're doing. And um, the Center for Family Involvement also has a social uh, has social media tools, um, and Aaron can drop those into if time permits. Aaron, 
So we want to thank you all for um, joining us today. This has been kind of a fast and furious SC chat, but we hope it's been helpful and that you all have gotten some information. Um, our next SC chat will be in the fall. Uh, we don't have a date or topic yet, but we um, have some ideas percolating. So we hope to see and you all will get emails um, about that. Um, Addie says she's adding CFI to her favorites uh, to share with families who love that idea. As um, a reminder, at the end of this, you will get a survey. When you complete the survey, you'll get your certificate of completion. Um, just remember, sometimes some of your agencies block our surveys. Check your spam folder. If you have any trouble, let me know. And when you download the certificate, the timestamp um, will change on it too, if that's a, um, a challenge for anybody. It will update and ch um, change for that. Erin just dropped some information for their social media too. So I hope that you all have a great afternoon and thank you so much for joining us and we will see you in the fall. Bye everybody. Thank you so much, have a great day.